Hello, this is Felix Felix. Welcome to my latest video, which is entitled Attracting Copiers in eToro, 5 Meta Strategies Compared. I've been thinking about making this video for a number of weeks and it's taken quite a long time to put together the material and do the research for it. So as always, I'm grateful for any subscribes, likes and positive comments in the chat and I'm happy to answer any questions. Before I start, I just want to do a quick disclaimer. Firstly, this video isn't financial advice. The purpose of this video is going to be to explore which strategies are the most effective at attracting copiers on eToro. These may not necessarily be the most profitable strategies or indeed ethical, and I'll examine why this is and why they tend to draw on copiers regardless of this. I'll be featuring anonymized screenshots taken from PIs on the eToro platform. Some of them I copy myself, some of them I used to copy, and some of them I never copy, but these shouldn't be taken as reviews of these PIs. The screenshots for, are for illustration purposes only to graphically demonstrate the strategies that I believe to be meta and optimal on the platform. And I've split the video into two parts due to its length. This has actually been recorded after those parts, so there might be a couple of bits that don't make sense. In total, there are some small errors that I spotted when watching it back. See if you can spot them, but I don't think it impacts on the overall message. So in part one, what we'll be doing is starting by explaining the concept of a meta strategy and giving an example of this being used in the context of video gaming. I'll then go on to apply this concept to eToro and outline five strategies that I believe to have been meta at some point on eToro and maybe will still be in terms of attracting copiers. And I'll complete part one by reviewing the first two of these five strategies. And in part two, we'll do the remainder of the strategies plus a summary and conclusion. So without further ado, let's get into the main video. First of all, in case anyone's wondering, when I talk about meta in this video, I'm not talking about the stock that used to be known as Facebook. What I'm speaking of is a meta strategy, which is one that's generally agreed upon to be the most effective at accomplishing a task or winning a game. And in this case, the game being played and the task being accomplished is to gather as many copiers as possible on eToro and retain those copiers. Over time, these meta strategies will evolve and new strategies will become meta, but we're going to try and establish what strategy at the moment is the most effective at attracting copiers and why. And just before we start, I want to give an example of a meta strategy from a dis different discipline, which is video gaming. This is a game I play called eFootball 2023. And you'll see here a formation that looks rather unusual because real football teams wouldn't play this in real life. It's got three centre backs. Everyone's playing down the middle. The front players are all squashed up. And the manager, G. Zeitzler, who is Jurgen Klopp, is basically playing something called a quick counter style. And this strategy is what all of the top players use on eFootball 2023 because if you put that up against a similarly skilled player using one of the other strategies like possession or out wide, this strategy will always come out on top. So what I'm going to do is try and find the equivalent strategy on eToro, one that in the hands of an equally skilled person would come out on top against other people. And here is five that I've come up with that have been used over the last few years I've used eToro and they're all still in operation now by various people on the platform. So starting at the left hand side, the first one's called High Beta, or in America you would pronounce it Beta. A large percentage of eToro's user base does not appear to understand compound interest. So if you have a portfolio that's High Beta, that exploits this flaw and we're going to take a look at that in a moment. The second one I'm going to look at is the old switcheroo, which is people who first of all make money with a high risk strategy and a small bankroll, and then switch to a safe strategy and a bigger bankroll, however continue to quote the lifetime results including the higher risk small bankroll portion of it. We're going to take a look at that second. Third one we're going to take a look at I've called Adapt and Thrive. This is basically long short traders who have a dynamic strategy and can change like the wind and try and time the market. This obviously can be very successful in bear markets as we've witnessed last year. That's the third one I'm going to be looking at today. The fourth one which I've mentioned quite a lot on the channel so I've kept that till near the end I've termed Dividend Doping. And that is very much about having a passive income, including potentially weekly dividends or even daily dividends. As we've seen, it's a surefire strategy for drawing in copiers. We're going to compare it to the other ones here. And the final one I'm going to be looking at is another one that's been deployed since time immemorial on eToro, and it's all green months. Um, and this is obviously something that always has been very appealing and still is to this day. So we're going to pit those five strategies against each other and ask ourselves which one 
is most effective at the moment on eToro as regards dragging in copiers. The first strategy we're going to do a deep dive on is called high beta, which I've termed also as confounding compounding, because I've noticed over the years on eToro that copiers will frequently misinterpret gains and instead of compounding or multiplying the yearly gains together or the monthly gains together, they do other things such as add them up or add them up and divide them by the number of years. This is not how a compound annual growth rate is calculated. So people, as a result, don't realize that a winning year of 50% or 100% will be canceled out by a losing year of 30% or 50%. Instead, they will think that a 100% year and a 50% losing year correlates to being a winning combination of years when in fact it's break even. And as such, portfolios that have got these big swings in them will attract more copiers than lower beta portfolios that actually have better risk adjusted returns and in some cases actually have better absolute returns. And that's what we're going to be looking at here in this section. I want to kick off this section by taking a look at a man who should need no introduction, although I'm not going to introduce him, and as someone who I copy myself and have the highest respect for. But what I've done here is taken a five year snapshot, and I want to just use this as an illustration of how confusing and how difficult it can be to calculate compound interest on the fly. Before I do so, I will say this PI has made over a thousand percent overall, and prior to 2018 made outstanding gains. But just taking this five year period in isolation, you would look at that and the first thing you're drawn to is a 103% gain in 2020 and a 52% gain in 2019. So you'd assume that this whole period must be a period where they outperformed S&P. However, when you crunch the numbers, it's actually a 25% gain in five years, which is less than 5% per year. Because remember, it isn't five times five. You have to compound them. And the S&P made 40% over the same period with lower risk. Therefore, it really does show that you have to crunch those numbers and when you adjust for risk, this is a period of underperformance, quite drastic underperformance, whereas at first glance you might say this is an outstanding performance because your eyes are drawn to those big triple digit figures. And example number two is taking it on a notch and this is similar at first glance but actually even more pronounced in that there's three very, very good years bookended by two very bad years. And again, the bad years, even though the numbers look smaller than the good years, the way compound interest works, this drags down the overall performance. And this person, who I've also got a great deal of respect for and I'd potentially even copy them in future, but this person during that five-year period made 5% in five years, which is less than 1% per year. And as we've said, the S&P 500 made 40% during that period. So really... What it does show is that you cannot just take a quick glance at these figures. You have to get the calculator out and work out what the actual gain was. And this, even though there's huge swings and big gains and big losses, actually works out to pretty much a break-even period, which you might not think at first glance. And it's taken on a stage further in this one. This is a PI who's an elite popular investor with almost five years history and has two big winning years. Um, which I presume is when most of the copiers came on board um, and they have another winning year this year in the making. But unfortunately for them, the three losing years have more than cancelled out the gains for the winning years and they've actually lost 35% overall um, in five years. Despite that, they have 2,000 copiers, almost 2,000 copiers, which you might think is remarkable, but it really does show you the, the psychological bias copiers have and also things like marketing and the image of the person or whatever, the person's personality. Again, I really like this person, absolutely no problem with them as a person, but the facts are their strategy hasn't done well in the last five years. And here's another one, someone who I also really like as a person, but I've mentioned him on the channel many times. The first thing you see here is two huge winning years, 275%, 118%. But as we've seen with the other ones, if you have losing years, these chip in at the returns, especially a big losing year, and this person's actually lost 79% in five years, yet still has over 50 copiers. And we're going to look at the reasons for that in a moment. But it just shows these winning years will bring in the copiers, and some of them will stick around, even during long barren periods. Um, so what are the psychological hooks? Why are these people drawing in so many copiers, despite five years, in some cases, of underperformance? Well, in some cases, it's because of what they've done before that, but in other cases, that is their entire record. So that can't explain it all. 
So first of all, copiers tend to copy after large spikes upwards and a high beta portfolio is going to have large spikes upwards, a low beta portfolio isn't. So those people, even though the low beta ones are better overall, people don't copy them because there's never a large spike upwards. eToro exacerbates this by promoting the PIs after these big winning years. Admittedly, they try and avoid promoting the ones that have had three digit winning years, but you'll look on your sidebar on eToro and see people who have done best in the last three months. And these are generally all crypto or leverage traders. So eToro is more likely to promote people that have made gains over the last two years rather than ones who have done well over a five year or longer period. Although some of the PIs I've shown you there have done well over more than five years. Well, one of them anyway. Um, and some copiers are averse to closing at a loss and will hold even during downturns. And that's how you explain even though these PIs are having huge losing years, some people do uh, toddle off during those losing years, but a lot of them stick around because they cannot bear to close at a loss. And you read them saying things like, as soon as this breaks even, I'm leaving. But of course, in some cases, they'll never break even because they're so far down, like the one you looked at with the 79%. Um, calculating compound interest properly takes effort, as we've seen, even for people who know how to do it, which I'm not convinced that many do, you can't just look at it by eyeballs and do it. I had to get a calculator out and calculate all those figures I've just shown you because unless you're extremely good at mental arithmetic, you can't do it in your head. And more importance tends to be attached to the upswings and the downswings, which is conversely, when people are doing their own trading, you feel the pain more in downswings than the joy of upswings. That's a psychological phenomenon. But for some reason, copy trading, it seems to work the opposite, especially if you're looking at a period where you weren't actually copying someone it seems to be that upswings are given more priority. Um, so overall, I'm going to summarize each strategy at the end as to a utopic presentation of it and a dystopic. So the utopia of this strategy would be that you can make 50, 100%, even 200% on a good year and have huge winning months. And that's what attracts people. And that's what PIs sometimes market themselves as doing. Whereas the dystopia, if you're a more negative person, would be there's a mathematical fact if you make 100%, that counts for nothing if you then lose 50% the next year or the previous year. And a 20% gain followed by 10% loss, even though it's the same ratio, is infinitely superior and actually puts someone in profit. Yet that will attract far fewer copiers than the person who made 100% gain. So now we're going to move on to the second of the five strategies. Next, we're going to take a look at the old switcheroo, which is also known as bait and switch. And I must say before we start, this is one I've been taken in by myself on numerous occasions. And you could actually say my gold standard has been filled with people uh, who have done this or who are still doing it. And what this involves is changing strategies, often from high beta, high return portfolio into low risk, low return. But the beauty of this strategy is when the PI markets themselves, they sort of do a combination between describing themselves as low risk, which is true because they are now, and also describing themselves as having high returns, which is true because they did make high returns and they're combining the results of two different time periods into one. Let's take a look at how this works in practice. It'll make more sense. So the first one I'm going to show you is someone who, as you can see here in 2017, made 540%. However, since there, he's done absolutamente nada. Uh, and no, he's not Spanish. I just thought I'd say that. And you can see there he's made basically no profit since then because remember the 30% does cancel out a 49% gain. Um, so what's happened though is this person has managed to gather and retain a lot of copiers. And part of that's because of the way they've marketed themselves. So if you look at this big gain, which was done using cryptocurrency as I understand it, this is how they're marketing themselves saying since eToro joined eToro in 2016, I've made a return of more than 900%. Well, that's factually true. As we've seen, almost all of that came in the early years. I've been a popular investor since 2017. So what that shows is that gain was made a lot of it before they became a popular investor because gain was made in 2016-17 and long-term fundamental investor with a focus on technology assets. Now, if you're just reading that, you might think that the person's 900% gain was made with the technology assets, but it wasn't. The 900% gain was made almost entirely by cryptocurrency with a high risk portfolio. But despite that, people conflate these as all being the same thing. And this person's got over 4,000 copiers. And at one point, I think I had over 20,000 copiers, despite the fact that really since 2016, 17, they haven't done anything on the platform. So the next one here is uh, what I call Mr. 25%, another one who I've mentioned many times on the channel. And you can see here, they've got a seven year period, but you can very much put it into a game of two halves. 
And the 2017-16, a huge amount of profit was made using a very high risk strategy with crypto and leveraged stocks. And in a five year period following that, no gains were made at all. This was a losing five year period. So you've got a two year winning period and a five year losing period. How do you think this was marketed? Well, it's been marketed as a seven year period with a 361% gain, which again, when you add on this year, 2023, that is technically true. Average return, 21%, that's also technically true. Lifetime goal, 25%, well, that's whatever you want it to be. Official value investor. Um, however, all of this only really tells half the story because all of the returns were made using a highly leveraged growth stock slash crypto portfolio. Um, and the losses of the last five years have been made using a completely different type of portfolio, much lower risk, very little crypto. So when you look at that, the seven years craftily lumps in the high risk, high return portfolio in with the current medium risk and zero return over the last five years portfolio. Here's another example of a PI not only being able to retain but grow their copier base despite a radical change in strategy. And this is someone I copy myself. The title better than Buffett, you might guess who it is. And you can see really again here, in 2016-17, a huge amount of money was made, including 40% in one month, presumably using things like Bitcoin, oil, at higher risk, maybe a bit of leverage. Whereas the last five years, there have been profits made. I don't really know how it compares to the market, probably roughly in line, depending on what index you use. But it's a totally different type of strategy, a diversified stock portfolio. Um, so it's very much, again, just like the one we saw before, it's two distinct strategies. And when this person quotes the results, surprise, surprise, they talk about 25% average annual return and say if you copied for $1,000, you'd now have over 8500 today, which is all technically true. So that's the beauty of this strategy is it's not incorrect to say that. But as we've seen, it's very much two different chapters within that period. And so to answer the question, are they better than Buffett? Yes, they're better than Buffett. Of course they are. We will ignore the fact that Buffett wasn't trading oil or crypto uh, during 2016. Um, so this is another one, a sea change. Someone who's really radically in 2020 had, I believe may have been crypto or may have been leveraged oil trade, something like that, and made 126%, but is then notched down to an extremely diversified low risk portfolio and has crowned out some admittedly impressive results during a very difficult period. But you can see there a huge shift in strategy and also a huge shift in returns. However, eToro, have continued to promote the PI based on their overall record, despite the fact that obviously 126% is not going to be replicated in the future with the current portfolio. So that's the beauty of this strategy of switching, but riding on the back of previous achievements. And this is a, a, a real a visual splendor, but it's one I've featured on my channel before. And essentially this is a PI with a long record who is in profit, but has these losing years, which do knock into the profits. But the one here is really the first month, 129%. If you include that, the overall returns are excellent, probably far better than the S&P and the NASDAQ. Whereas if you withdraw the 129%, it becomes a very uh, mediocre returns, especially when you factor in the volatility and adjust for risk, which is beyond the scope of this video. But it just shows what a difference even one month makes if the one month is big enough. So those are all examples of people who are riding on the back of a formerly successful period but haven't been anywhere near as successful since then. Um, and how does this work psychologically? Well, first of all, there is no way of seeing in-depth records older than one year, so we can't actually go back and see what they were doing in those older years. I just have to assume it's higher risk, I have to assume it's crypto because you can see the swings and you know that it's not a diversified stock portfolio. Um, and also primacy and recency effect as it work a psychological phenomenon, namely primacy, which is the first thing you see, see, seems to stick in your head more than the middle bit. And so if someone's made a lot of profit five or six years ago and a little bit of profit in 2023, you tend to ignore the fact that they've done nothing for the five years in between. And people will in their minds conflate low risk with high returns, even though the low risk is now and the high returns were then, they seem to think of it as being, oh, this person's got high returns with low risk, when in actual fact those two things took place at a different time period. And PIs can factually say I made X amount in Y period because it's not a lie to say so. It's not a lie for this person to say I made 25% per year for X amount of years. Well, the second one anyway. Um, 
because they did, but what they're not saying is there was two radically different strategies used during that period. And um, kudos can sometimes even be gained by saying that they've masterfully masterminded uh, uh, an exodus from crypto. They exited Bitcoin when it was at its peak in 2016. They switched a stock strategy and they'll change back again when crypto's on a bull run. So sometimes this can be passed off as being a strategic shift. But in reality, I find that almost always the reason they've shifted lower risk is because they've joined the PI program and they have to go lower risk. And also they're dealing with big amounts of money. People tend to get more risk averse when they're managing huge amounts of money. Um, so the utopia of the strategy is that if you're copying someone since day one, you'd be a scrolling percent up. However, if you think about it realistically, you're never going to copy someone on day one. Why would you copy some unknown person on day one? Realistically, people start copying once someone's already got track record. And a lot of these people we've been looking at, once the track record's been built, they actually didn't do well after that point. They did well before that point. And that's really what's went wrong with my eToro gold standard project is this phenomenon. And these previous triple digit winning years will probably never be replicated, first of all, because the portfolio is low risk, second of all, because the limits to the PI program, and also because the market conditions are different. We're in a high inflation, high interest environment, so we may not see these 100% gains again. Welcome to the end of part one, and congratulations to anyone who's made it this far. However, that's only half the battle. In part two, I will be covering the remaining three meta strategies, as well as drawing conclusions as to which ones work best in various market conditions. I'm then going to look at meta marketing and how this can boost the copier count in addition to the effects of the way the portfolio's actually constructed. And I'm going to end by giving my verdict on which strategy is most meta in 2023 and why this is. So I hope you can join me for part two, which I'll release in midweek.